Hello, welcome back. Thank you very much indeed to Talib. And I now have the honor of introducing our next moderator and his panel, full of big thinkers, to consider rethinking investments for better preparedness against potential future, future catastrophes. Our moderator is a fellow journalist, a seasoned observer. He takes no prisoners. Uh, is an incisive commentator on the travel industry over the years. And like Taleb, I guess he's seen it all and done it all. But this situation, Peter, I suspect is even a first for you. Peter Greenberg. Well, John, thank you very much. And welcome from New York and wherever you all happen to be. Happy to be with you today. Uh, to answer your question, Arjan, it is a first for all of us. Uh, this is the longest period of time I've ever been in one place since I'm 17 years of age. And to put it in perspective, I've solved my problem by creating my own special passport. And I stamp it every time I go between my bedroom and my living room just to make <laughs> myself feel better. So uh, hopefully I'll get the real passport out uh, very soon. And that's what we're really going to be talking about today. I want to start, before introducing our panelists, with just some statistics here. Uh, we're talking about 100 million jobs at risk in travel. Uh, we're talking 100% of the countries under the UNWTO that have some travel restrictions. About 60% of them right now have effectively closed themselves to, uh, uh, to incoming travel. Uh, and then, of course, the elephant in the room that has become the room, and what we're going to talk about today and how to deal with it, is deep-seated fear on a global level. Uh, we know that airlines are failing. Uh, we're talking about a $550 billion hit, according to IATA, and that's for the airlines that are still flying. Uh, cruise ships are going to stay at anchor until next year. Uh, tourist boards have been, in many cases, paralyzed by this. Uh, but the one thing that has remained the same and has come to the forefront is that as a society, and, I, and I'm speaking on a global level, we don't just want to travel, we need to travel. So it's not a matter of if or when, but how. And then, of course, the lessons that were learning along the way. And towards that end, we've got five distinguished panelists joining me today. I'd like to introduce them. Uh, the Honorable Edmund Bartlett, who's the Minister of Tourism of Jamaica. I hope he's with us now. Uh, Elena Contura, my friend, now a member of the European Parliament. Of course, I've known her in her previous incarnation at the government level as the Minister of Tourism of Greece. Uh, Nicholas Meyer, who's the leader of PwC's Lodging and Tourism Clients and uh, manages tourism strategy. Uh, Dr. Peter Tarlow, another old friend of mine, uh, and I'm professor in Texas, and also the, professor, the president of uh, Safer Travel. And uh, last, but certainly not least, my good pal, Alain Senange, who uh, is the president of the African Tourist Board. Nicholas, if I can, I'd like to start with you, because we've seen the statistics out there that tell us that while the, while, you know, the rest of the economy might be in a recession. The tourism economy could be in a, in a depression. We're talking about 51% unemployment at this point. We're talking about 38% job loss just in the last month. And of course, the lessons that we have to learn from all of this, and let's go back if we can, uh, Nicholas, you know, what did we learn after 9-11 about the resiliency and preparedness in the travel industry? What did we learn after the 2008-2009 recession? What did we learn even after the 2010 volcanic eruption in Iceland? And of course, what are we learning right now to help us prepare uh, in terms of how we you know, shape our investments to prepare for the next potential catastrophe? Nicholas, what are your statistics telling you? Statistics tell me that we learn and forget in 10 year cycles. Um, so to be fair, this one is slightly different than the previous crises. I'm not saying that the previous ones did not affect certain people very, very brutally, but uh, as I had said a little bit earlier today uh, in, in the conference, this one is, is, is different because it is um, both a crisis and a depression in demand and in the supply chain, and at the same time because it is on one hand global, so everywhere, rather than regional or continental, but at the same time phased. So, this is about as messy as it can get if you're in the business of trying to advise your client as to how this one may play out, right? So what have we learned or what are we learning right now? Well, there's, there's a number of things. I think, first of all, on the positive element, we are learning now quite closely. There is no intention of people not to travel anymore, right? So um, they can't right now. They won't as they used to. But the desire of continuing to travel is there. And you see this not just sentimentally, but you see it wherever it's possible, also quite statistically. 
Secondly, we see that there is a need for at least an intermittent or intermediary tourism financing at a government, at a para-government and at an industry level to basically get people out of the starting blocks again. And lastly, what we are learning is that perhaps as an industry, we have not sufficiently honed our skills in cash flow management and have too often used cash flow as an element in negotiation to basically get a better deal. And that's coming back to bite us now, although quite frankly, I think even very, very good cash flow planners would be in trouble now and are in trouble now, given the, the magnitude of this crisis. But that's what we have about alert. You know, Nicholas, just to, re to respond to that, you know, when we talk about it from a consumer angle, we see the, the, the big players, the IHGs, the Marriott's, the Hilton's, et cetera, uh, you know, struggling with their employment levels, closing their hotels, and that's short-term thinking. But what the public doesn't see, but I think you do, is that the real crisis here, and you mentioned cash flow, are the owners of those buildings, unable to meet their debt service and not having properly, properly prepared for that uh, in, in the long term. How many hotels do you see coming back? I'm not talking about brands, I'm talking about individual institutions. Probably more than we currently think right now. So if you mean by coming back, how many will, will survive and come back, Correct. right? Correct. Um, <laughs> In a very perverse way, the fact that this is global and affects everyone and to some extent also affects a lot of people that usually would want to grow by buying hotels probably makes that this is perhaps slightly less dramatic than it sounds. So this is, and it, it's a term that has become almost household, this is an exercise of pretend and extend these days. So the collectivity of the lending sector together with the collectivity of the real estate um, uh, uh, holders agreeing that let's try to get through this, let's extend a little bit or, or a lot, and then try to stabilize again on the new terms. No bank wants to suddenly become a hotelier by default. We, yeah, we went through that in the United States about 20 years ago um, with, with all the, the savings and loan defaults, with the bankers yeah. ending, owning hotels they couldn't manage. Uh, yeah. Let's go beyond that because when we had our situation with the pandemic here in the United States, you know, the, the federal government, uh, there's a, a lot of movement within the legislation to basically throw a lot of money at it uh, to try to think, keep it going. Uh, there was, you know, payroll protection plans, but nobody really had a rainy day fund in place for anything close to this. Do you see something like this happening now, now that we're experiencing it, where governments and a, maybe a, a private a public partnership create that kind of emergency funding mechanism? Well, we'll probably see it through a variety of mechanisms. I mean, quite honestly, I'm not sure how big such a fund would have to be to accommodate such a global you know, pandemic as this one. But when we look at where elements of what you're talking about start to appear, I mean, there are insurance products. They are in, you know, basically um, solidarity funds in some of the countries where that has a tradition. They are perhaps in more structured impulse funds uh, where governments say, okay, we need to support our tourism players, but perhaps at the same time also tie some of our funding that we're going to give them in short term to certain conditions in the future that they set themselves up properly, right? So a lot of governments say, I'll help you and I'll gladly help you, but I expect that you have a certain behavior that enables you or increases your chances to actually get out of this more solidly than you have been. So I, I doubt that we're gonna see a global super fund that is going to take care of the next three pandemics. Let's hope they're not here, they don't come. But mechanisms of what you're addressing, you see all over the place right now. One last question, Nicholas, before we turn it over to some of our other panelists, and that is you mentioned an insurance product. One of the things we've learned uh, quite acutely in this pandemic is that whatever insurance was out there wasn't what was needed. Uh, policies had, clauses in there that excluded coverage uh, for pandemic, for example. Uh, do you see an opportunity here for some creative writing going forward so that new insurance premiums and new insurance policies can be written that are actually effective, even with higher premiums, that can help the industry? Well, I think they will be necessarily certainly in the ramp up and they will stay because people will actually start to appreciating them, right? I mean, and this includes us as tourists as well. We cannot say 
if I travel again, I expect the tour operator or the airline or the hotelier or the destination to take, to assume the full risk of a wave two or of a shutdown or whatever. So first of all, this will means that we're gonna need a reweighing of the, of the risks. And I think these famous, you know, buy now, pay later, all risk is on me, the hotelier, come on over whenever you can. While they're great to entice people to kick off the travel again, they're not sustainable, right? So there's going to be a rebalancing. Insurances are going to take off or, or away the peaks, perhaps, of the uh, of the risk element. And other than that, um, I, I think we simply need to collectively, as an industry supply chain, if you will, basically share our share the risk assumption. So we're going to see new products. We're going to probably see element well. They've existed all along. I mean, travel cancellation insurance, at least I'm, you know, I grew up in Switzerland. We've had them for 50 years. You just don't take them because it is, has become so unlikely. So existing and new solutions will take care of them, but there is no such thing as a risk-free ride. I gotcha. I'm going to come back and talk about that a little bit later. Sure. If Minister Bartlett is with us, uh, Edmund, are you there? Well, welcome, Edmund, and, and, and thank you for joining us. You know, when you and I spoke not too long ago, you were facing a situation you've never faced before, where you literally went from 100 miles an hour down to zero, not just in Jamaica, but in the entire region of the Caribbean, and in tourist-based economies, where travel and tourism drives the economy. It puts food on the table of everyone. Uh, you and I have talked before uh, about tourism and being resilient. Uh, you, won't have the, you have that center of resiliency, which we'll talk about. But tourism has proven itself in the past to be quite resilient and bouncing back. Right now, we're not bouncing back. We're sort of inching back. And in the United States, for example, the Treasury can print new money, I suppose, and throw $6 trillion into it. But something tells you that the central banks of the Caribbean don't have that ability. So how do you prepare with an investment strategy for something like this to happen, maybe in another form, down the road? Well, that is the million-dollar question as we try to grapple. First of all, you know we have a, a regional bank, the Caribbean Development Bank. Uh, we also rely, as you know, heavily on multilateral support from uh, the World Bank, uh, IMF, and so on. So the IMF has been looking at how it could provide some kind of uh, soft line to, to some of our destination. The Jamaica is the first recipient of that soft line of of um, half a billion US dollars as a standby support arrangement uh, for um, your balance of payments and so on. Uh, the local regional central bank is, is gearing up, but the hard cold facts are the resource is not there and, and the demand in all the islands, especially the fact that we have a huge tourism dependence here, as you know, um, the GDP dependence within the region exceeds 50% on average per island. And in some of the islands is up to 95%. So to, to, to ask for foreign exchange support from regional banks is going to be not just Hukurlian, but almost impossible. Uh, how do we build back? Uh, we're going to have to look a lot more at how do we create this small, the 80% of tourism, which is the small and medium enterprises. That's where we have to look first. How do you build back that element? And it's perhaps a little easier because the, the call for, 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 for what you call hard cash um, is, is less and, and more soft um, capital development, if you will, that will be required. So we see um, the small islands coming back through the small and medium enterprises, the SMTE, as we call them in tourism, but the SME, as the rest of the community calls them. Um, and a, a program is being developed in our areas right now. Um, the World Bank has a program called Ready, which offers that kind of support to a number of the smaller areas. Uh, but Peter, one of the real concerns that we have is the, the, the ability for us to have rescue operations um, and the pandemic is prevailing. We are managing it reasonably well. But the big problem is how do we uh, create a response when 
incidents happen in our region. And I think that the tourist community is looking to us for that because part of building the confidence is if something happens to you, what? And so a lot of the investment that we're looking for now is to help us to create some capacity to respond. How do we have better health facilities? How do we get investment now in uh, hospitals, in better clinics? Uh, how do we uh, provide the, the, even the socio, um, the biosocial social and, and, and biosecurity equipment that are needed? What we're calling the COVID security um, equipment that are required. So we are trying to open, and we're trying to open next week, but we are acutely aware that the key element of that is a missing link of the response mechanisms in our area. You manage fine, you're managing the risk beautifully, but when the visitor starts coming in, you're going to need a strong response mechanism because your potential for risk increases and the possibility that you will have infection spread is there. Well, Edwin, let me ask you this. In the last panel, one of the panelists mentioned, you know, a lack of global leadership in terms of response. Uh, we see that continuing now. There's no one, you know, universally accepted or vetted protocol here. Every country is acting on its own best interests, uh, making different rules that change by the hour. Uh, in our own country, in the United States, uh, the, the Centers for Disease Control put out a protocol to follow and 28 of those 50 states have ignored them. Uh, at the same time, you're dealing with consumers who have gone from fear of missing out to fear of going out. And so everybody's looking for a guarantee. Business, businesses want a guarantee before they travel their employees. Employees want guarantees before they travel either for business or for leisure. And you in Jamaica and your fellow countries want a guarantee before you let us in. So in terms of responding to something, and then of course anticipating it, what protocols can be put in place either through the UNWTO or the UN itself so that we get that sort of global leadership so people know, just like you carry a passport, what you're allowed to do and when you're allowed to do it? You know, we've been thinking about that and in the discussions that we've had before with you, Peter, we've talked a lot about uh, a resilience index. Now you may not have to look at a, a COVID uh, resilience index where based on a number of touch points universally accepted, we could determine uh, the level of preparedness of countries, the, the capacity of countries to respond and therefore grade them and, and put them in some kind of arrangement, um, perhaps from one to 10 as the case might be. So we could give the world a sense of what type of uh, security you can expect going into destination Y, destination X, as the case might be. Uh, and that same barometer that we'll be talking about would also provide uh, the, the key uh, response points. We would define the, the areas, for example, social distancing, let's say, as a, as a key area. We would define that. We would also develop a whole lot of protocols around that. The issue of full sanitization and, um, uh, and the technology that is required in a lot of cases to facilitate that. Uh, then we, we, we look at screening, for example, if that's a, a requirement and the, the extent to which countries have the capacity to screen and to test what type of testing, um, what is the, is the defined acceptable testing method? Is it the PCR or is, is it these rapid tests that we're seeing coming around? It is these sort of touch points that I believe we're able to establish an agreement. And the UNWTO, WTTC, and World Health Organization and CDC would become very critical uh, global instruments in putting that together and agreeing on this kind of a formula that will enable small countries like ours and countries in general to have some benchmarks and to be able to gauge their own preparedness to accept this. You know, talking about guarantees and fear, I'm reminded of something that I saw, I experienced it myself about five years ago when I flew to Panama. And as I came off the airplane, I was walking towards customs and immigration and there was a gentleman there who handed me a form. I just thought it was another customs form to fill out. It wasn't. 
it was a, a note to me and to every other passenger coming off that plane that while we were in Panama, as a gift from the Panamanian government to everybody, didn't matter whether you were in first class or coach, your medical expenses would be covered if you got sick in Panama and they'd fly you home. It was all being financed Excellent. by the government. Uh, I was amazed by that. I was impressed by that. And when I left, I talked to the Minister of Tourism there and I said, tell me something. What's the percentage of use of this document? He said it was less than 2%, but the, the message that it sent uh, was almost an incentive for people to come to Panama. Uh, and as you're opening now, you're almost the test case now in the Caribbean to see how, in, how you can incentivize investment to not only show up there, but to do so safely. And, and I'll be interested to see what happens. And, and that brings me up to my next contestant here on The Price is Right, and that's Elena, who, uh, uh, in fact, isn't it ironic, Elena, that the last time you and I spoke, we were talking about over-tourism. We were talking about how you change the seasons around in Greece to try to offset that and environment and sustainability. You're now opening in Greece. Um, and what are you putting in place right now? I know you're doing it in stages, but at the same time, where are you investing? Where is Greece investing so that we don't have a deja vu moment uh, going down the road? You have to unmute yourself, Elena. Unmute yourself, there yes, you go. I did, I did. Thank you so much, first of all, for your invitation. And this meeting, I think, is very important in setting the pace on how we move uh, forward all together because a crisis of such uh, magnitude, no country and no economy. So um, my point is that as long as we don't have an effective uh, cure, effective therapy or uh, a vaccination, the virus is here and uh, we have um, to be really, to prevent uh, how we're gonna, um, travel, how our daily life is, uh, because everything changed. Nothing is the same. The way we travel, the way we uh, go for vacation, even our um, routine, our day routine changed how we go to work. So there, for me, top priority is testing. I totally am convinced that is the only way, testing before we travel to our destination. And I tell you why. Uh, in Greece, we really manage uh, the health crisis very well. Actually, right now, um, uh, it's, it's very sad to uh, um, the everyday work, let's say, uh, and uh, the everyday routine in Greece. Um, but all the flights that they're coming from outside Till the end of uh, June, we test them and we saw that there are a lot of um, uh, positives, uh, uh, cases that they're coming to Greece. So we put them in a guarantee. But in order to open up, so not to be a conflict uh, with the economy, because the economy has to restart again. And tourism, as you know, is accelerator of and very productive and growth for our economy not only Greece, but all the south of uh, Europe, Mediterranean, and north, I would say. I mean, don't forget about France. I mean, they have, uh, or England, they have uh, top, top uh, 70 million tourists this year. So it's very important to make sure that we will protect not only uh, uh, the people that they will travel to the destination, but also the destination. Why? Because we don't, uh, forget the asymptomatic, the people that they have the virus, but they don't uh, have the disease. So this is very, very dangerous. So I'm totally convinced and I uh, think that we have to make sure that till uh, an effective cure will, will be found, we need to do the test. Now, the rapid tests uh, are okay. I think uh, they're very accurate. I think uh, it's very fast. You do it and you know what is going on uh, right away. So it's important to know before you travel because if you're sick, it's definite that you're not going to travel. But if you're not and you're asymptomatic, it's a huge issue. So for Greece, this is what I proposed. 
But unfortunately, for the moment, we don't know what is going to happen from the 1st of July that Greece opens the boards and open for tourists. Tourists uh, will start only with sampling tests. And this is my biggest fear because the disease, the, the, the virus, the ep ep epidemic can be spread uh, in a lot of different destinations. And the same is for every country. My dear friend from Jamaica, that he's also very strong in tourism, uh, has the same fear. Uh, Spain, Italy, all the countries that they will open up. Also, epidemiologists, they say that we have to see what's going on in, in, uh, in its country and how the boards they will open. For example, there's countries in Europe that they were very strong, effective, and they closed down the boards, but people, they want to travel from these countries and go to other countries that they open up. So what is going to happen there? So for me, must be testing. The second thing is the business to stay alive, uh, to avoid bankruptcies and to avoid laid off. It's very important because uh, the next day of uh, uh, this crisis, they have to find the business strong and competitive. Otherwise, there are going to be a lot of huge problems, as you know, like, for example, countries that uh, they will have a little bit stronger economy, so uh, they will uh, be buying, they will buy all the uh, companies that uh, they will almost going uh, to close down. And also don't forget about the uh, unfair competition, which means that uh, countries that they will um, uh, survive, let's say in their economies, they will be down. Uh, they will need the tourism. So there will be a lot of, I will use the uh, word blackmail to put down the prices as we see a lot of, um, times when there is um, uh, a recession and uh, that's a very uh, big risk and dangerous and the last thing is to, to be able to save um, uh, jobs because as you said um, the um, travel and tourism sector uh, has provided the um, uh, the most, um, how can I say, the biggest is an accelerator of economy and provides uh, the biggest uh, number of jobs. So it's very dangerous all these people to lose their job because then they are not going to have uh, uh, money to, to, to spend. The business will not make uh, um, uh, and it, this is viral, goes uh, like a, a chain. So it's very, very dangerous. In order to close my uh, hypothesis, my uh, my statement, I have to say testing very important testing uh, to give um, uh, to the uh, the possibility to the uh, business to stay alive even with subsidies, not more debts, not more loans, and to make sure that we will save uh, the jobs. Well, one question that comes out of this for all of our panelists, but I'll ask you first, Elena, is that if you look at the traditional playbook of the travel and tourism industry, when they're dealing with a, with a, with a problem, with a, when they're dealing with a, a crisis, is to try to discount their way back. Uh, you mentioned that just now about how, about how many people are going to just try to sell the, sell the product for below cost just to get people to come. Is that really going to work when we're dealing in an environment of such fear on a global level? we have to be very careful it's the big risk because if this business they don't have an immediate funding they don't have access to affordable loans and also further facilitations regarding taxation uh, they have so many financial obligations so uh, we're going to have a huge problem and imagine that if this uh, business they go bankruptcy uh, uh, they they will lay off uh, uh, the, 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 the workers, so it, it's a huge um, uh, vicious cycle. So we need definitely to protect uh, the business and also see what's going on with privatization, like private and uh, public sector. You see even big, huge companies like Lufthansa had to 
uh, change all her policy. And I think now uh, they uh, uh, discuss in about 25% to be in the public sector. It, it, it's, a lot of things are changing. And I'm very, very, how can I say, um, um, I, I worry a lot how things will develop the next day for the economy, because as you see, this battle between uh, the health, um, uh, the protecting of the health and the restarting of the economy, it's, it's a battle and, and there is no winner. So we have to decide uh, to save both. And in order to save both, I think testing is important, uh, funding for uh, the business is important to, 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 to save them and the jobs. Well, one of the things you just brought up, that battle between saving health and saving the economy, couldn't be any more, uh, as, a, as a good example, than the cruise industry. Uh, right now, uh, you know, you have a huge cruise industry that comes into Greece. Uh, and Alain in, in the Seychelles, uh, you've already made a decision uh, for the moment to ban cruise ships of, of coming in. Canada has banned cruise ships from coming in until October 31st. Uh, we may not see a cruise leave anywhere around the world in substance until maybe, or in big numbers, until early next year. As we think or rethink investments to, to, protect the, to protect ourselves against another potential catastrophe, what policies are happening in both Greece and in the Seychelles in the long term about the, econ the economic impact of cruise ships? Uh, I'll start, I can... and then I'll go to Alain. Alain, just quickly, and then we'll go to Alain. Listen, we have to take a lot of measures. Greece is trying to uh, protect, uh, let's say, uh, the, the life of the people, but at the same time wants to open, to protect the economy. So there are a lot of directives that they're going out. And I, I have to mention that Greece also follow the European, the Commission uh, directives, which is very important. And I want to close with this. Even in Europe, we don't have common rules. Uh, all the instructions are different and they're very general for different countries. So, uh, as you said, a lot of countries, they decide different measures. Greece is trying to combine as much as uh, they can uh, the protection of the life and also uh, not to go our economy in a recession. But I have to say that my proposal of a crisis uh, mechanism of European crisis mechanism was adapted from the Commission because it's very important because it's not over tourism as we spoke. You remember last year the bankruptcy of um, big tour operator um, Thomas Cook. Thomas Cook. Then there are things like extreme weather um, uh, um, problems that we face, and at the same time secure security problems. You know the the refugee crisis, the terrorist crisis. There are so many things that they need to to, uh, to be approached in a, in a one way. So it's very important for me um, a European um, uh, crisis management mechanism, and I'm so happy that this continues. I, and I want to say also that right now, in two weeks, we're going to have uh, the um, revolution for, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the resolution oh. Oh, nice. <laughs> for tourism, which is actually a revolution. It's true because it's the first time that uh, the commission takes very serious travel and tourism. And also in September, uh, the Commissioner Breton announced uh, the first tourism summit. So out of the crisis, one good thing uh, arise is that they take much more serious now uh, the travel and tourism industry, which is not only the accelerator of uh, economy. I think it's, uh, the, it's, it's, it's the sector that also uh, gives to other sectors a, a lot of growth. So it's very important. And sometimes, you know, out of the crisis comes something good. And that's why we're here today. Uh, Alain, I want to talk to you first about the Seychelles and then Africa in general. But my, my question to Elena continues about your decision to, to ban cruise ships at this point. Uh, you're not alone in that, but they are a huge part of the economy. How do you prepare going forward to reintroduce them if you're going to do that at all? Well, as you know, um, not... Uh, a member of the government right now, we are in the opposition, actually. Elena, hold on a second. I'm going to Alain. Ah, okay, I'm sorry. Thank I, I, you. I understand. I'll get back to Alain. But we all like listening to Elena. 
But one <laughs> thing, Peter, one thing that would be good after that is to ask Elena, the planes that landed in Greece that were positive people on board, which country did they origi originate from? It's an important question because we are all looking where people are moving and where the those that are still infected are coming from. And I'm sure our good friend, Dr. Peter Talo will be able to put that in his script after that. But cruise ships in Seychelles has been banned until 2022 for two reasons. One is COVID because now including cargo ships, they need to be at least 14 days at sea before entering Seychelles. So the incubation period is done. Even steamers that come in with, with containers must have been leaving a port, re let Seychelles know, be on the sea for 14 days, and then radio in how the, the crew are, are feeling so that we know the incubation period has com been completed. And then the health authorities would board the ship on arrival. We are lucky we are in the middle of an ocean. But cruise ships proper, we know we've invested a fortune to bring cruise ships into the Seychelles initially. The region, the Vanilla Islands region, which Seychelles, Mauritius, Madagascar, Réunion, Comores, and Mayotte, together we've invested to have this route of cruise ships that do the Indian Ocean. So we will need to work back. But the Seychelles government a bit has, has uh, piggybacked on COVID to do work on the port. They're actually redoing the whole slab of the port in one go over the course of next year and the year after, which is why primarily they can't accept a big cruise ship on the port because there'll be no area for the containers and the passengers together. I think they've, they've used the occasion of COVID at the same time, keeping Seychelles safe with so many passengers because we were having a cruise ship a week. So it was a lot of passengers coming in. And so they've, they've used that as a means. But Seychelles is opening itself, but I'll wait for your next question and talk about that. Uh, yes, uh, and as you start opening, and this also expands to Africa in general, you know, all of us for years wanted to make sure that we could follow the money. We talk about investing here, uh, that if you're going to go on a safari in Africa, that the money went back to the local community to sustain them economically. Uh, right now, of course, there is no money locally going to the local community because there's no tourism. Where do you see that coming down? It was, it was one of the questions I asked of Edmund Bartlett earlier about how do you infuse capital at this moment, at this crucial moment, to keep those economies alive, to be able to put food on the table so you can prepare for tourism to come back? I think, Peter, some countries are better placed than others, obviously, because of the reserves of the country itself. Seychelles, we are, as small as we are, lucky that everyone is still earning a salary, either from the industry or from the government in that bailout package that has been promised now until December. But after December, if we don't solve the COVID issue out, there will start to be issues. But already, even with this measure, there's already redundancies climbing in very fast. So more and more people are now going on the government payroll instead of the private sector payroll. But when you talk about Africa, this COVID-19 has arrived at the worst possible time. Africa was starting to climb from the 5% of global tourism market arrivals and had gone up to 6 odd percent. That's according to the UNWTO. We needed something to keep us going up as a continent. We have everything, it is quite clear. But where we have failed, and we need to accept as a continent where we failed, we allowed tourism to sit there. We did not put enough measure to protect tourism and to move the other industries with it as we moved along. Today, we find that with tourism collapsing, everything has collapsed, including in Seychelles. Now we're running to replant, doing agriculture. We're running to look at coconuts again for export of copra, dried coconuts or oil. We're relooking at everything else, but it's a bit late. We, it will take us years to, to move. So we need tourism to kickstart the economy and then move everything forward. But the whole of Africa, Peter, and I listened to, to my good friend, Minister Bartlett, Edmund, to the, the world needs to, one is appreciate tourism. If COVID has done one thing, it's got the world to understand that tourism is vulnerable and that tourism needs all the attention to make tourism work. How do we open an airport, which we are opening now mid-June? How do you open an airport and be safe? You can never be safe. 
because WHO, World Health Organization, has said already, with or without a vaccine, COVID is there for a long time. If that is the premise, how do you really protect the inhabitants as an island, Elena, a big country, or Edmund, another island like us, much, much bigger? How do you reopen with all measures? We were meant to have a charter from Israel starting now. The charter is cancelled with the essentials going to pick up in Tel Aviv. Only because of the requirements of the health authorities. You need a test before and then another test on arrival. As, as we put more and more uh, programs into place to bring in safety, we also destroy tourism. So it is a line that we will have to sit as professionals or as experts or as participants in the world of tourism to find a solution for. Well, Alam, here's, you bring up a big question. That is, in the absence of widespread testing or a workable, scalable, distributable uh, vaccine, can you ever rethink investment to prepare yourself for another issue like this effectively? No, I, I, I am worried about it. When earlier somebody spoke about the ash crisis or a terrorist attack somewhere, they were very located to some area. This one is global. And it has dried up everything from planes to tourists and commerce followed around it. I am a firm believer, and I'm sure Peter was in the conference with me and the African Tourism Board, Hope Project, a few weeks ago, where we talked or we were informed of a rapid test out of Germany, which said three minutes, and the three minutes tell you 98 to 99.9% .9 if you have it or if you don't have it. But the test for Seychelles, it could be easy to go down the path to say every port that we are flying from will be done at the airport itself a test because it's not that difficult. We have seven airports about that deals with Seychelles. So it is quite easy probably. But for a country like Greece or, or Jamaica that has planes coming from everywhere, it's a nightmare. So do we now have a, a COVID passport to say that it has to be done within five days of departure, if you get a passport, how much will that be? If people are talking about $300 for a, a real test, is that a budget that the tourist industry can really afford over and above the cost? Are we not draining the income of countries in preparedness for, to qualify as a traveler? It's more like passing a test to be able to, to get into another country. As we put all these, measures on top of it, you find an airport, even like Seychelles has done, that's increased its arrival fee or the, the debarkation fee, which I think is, is, is criminal, in a time where you want people to come and you don't put obstacle races to get them in. I really believe we will have to sit as a community of nations to really say, where do we go? It is impossible to think from the past and to try and implement it today. The whole barometers have changed and we will have to adapt ourselves to new measures. You know, we, we talk about the other Peter on the panel, so let's introduce him. Peter Tarlow, my friend from Texas, who uh, is the president of Safer Tourism. Peter, you're all about anticipation and then response. Yes. What are you telling your clients right now? What are you telling them in terms of this great unknown, not about the virus itself, but how you reinvest? and how you prepare. Well, thank you, Peter. And it's wonderful to be with all of you. And Alan, I'm praying for you every day to win your presidency. So you're in my prayers. Um, I think I everyone has- So thank you for bringing it up. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think we are, we're all rooting for you. Um, the first, even before I get to that particular issue, I want to speak about a few background things and some facts. I think they're very important so we don't make mistakes. First one is, this is a moving virus. It's not a stable virus. What do I mean by that? That means that we're going to have to change vaccines because we already have seen the virus mutate into 12 different forms. That means if you have a vaccine for one, it's not necessarily going to work for the other. Secondly, testing in the same way is not necessarily going to be successful in, in the way it's not a panacea and I want to emphasize it doesn't mean not to test it means don't put your 
eggs all in one basket because that's not going to work. Thirdly, we need to go back and look at some of the, we really have three wars here. We have the war we might call of the experts versus the public, the economic war, and the war for health. Those are three different areas that have to be looked at. And it is very important when we look at the economic war that we, the last time we, the world faced this was in 1929 with the Great Depression. And we made many good moves and many mistakes in 1929. We cannot, in 1929, one of the things we learned is that we cannot use the public sector to buy ourselves out of a crisis. We're going to have to come up with more creative methodologies because we, if we, government in the end is the redistribution of money. Rarely does government produce money. And therefore that comes from the private industry. So if we lose the private industry, we're going to lose eventually next year or two years, we're gonna be talking about the great economic crisis as a result of overspending and not having to, and trying to figure out some way that we pay back the money that we borrowed. So we're going to have to really think this through in a very careful way. Secondly, and I think it was Elena who brought it up with the issue of poverty, and Alan also, Alan also brought it up. It's not just a single issue. I'm now losing money. It's now a question of if I, as poverty might grow, will that create other sub problems? such as issues of law enforcement, issues of rioting, issues of people burning down buildings. And how does that therefore create new issues of um, negative publicity or people's fear to travel, not only because of the fact that they might get sick, but now they might be caught in a riot or an unstable political situation. And so one of the things we need to be doing is thinking much more creatively. Now, small countries like Alain, I think, have certain advantages over big countries, like, say, the United States, because it's much easier to get control of a small situation than it is when you have hundreds of airports, thousands of different regulations, and we're seeing a whole different world. So we're going to have to think universally, globally, but act locally. I'm a member of my own police department, and it We've had 27 different sets of regulations in the last year or since uh, the last few months. Every day I get a new set of protocols. In the end, I've had to say, excuse me, I teach at a medical school. I'm just going to create my own protocols. But that, what we're saying is that we're going to have to find protocols that are different for Seychelles than they are for Greece or for the United States or Jamaica. Now, Minister Bartlett was right, and then I'll let you, uh, in that uh, I just finished a book yesterday on um, security and COVID-19 in the Caribbean. And one of the things that is a real problem in that part of the world, but maybe in other parts of the world, is the lack of health care. So if we have, for example, in Africa, COVID-19 protocols, but I don't know how many ventilators I have, how quickly I can get people to hospitals, where the hospitals are, where the doctors are who've been trained in those types of uh, diseases, then I, I can have all the protocols in the world, but I can't enforce them. So I need to begin to start with some really basic things. What do we have? What don't we have? What protocols do we have in working interactively? In other words, how um, if I come to a place and I get sick, um, you mentioned, Peter, the Panama example. I love that example. Unfortunately, Panama had to cancel it because too many people took, misused it. And finally, the Panamanian government said, enough. So that was, but it isn't anymore. And that's kind of tragic. But I did love it at the time. Those Peter, are let me, issues. I wanted to ask you a question and I'll also throw it over to Nick. And that's this. You mentioned, of course, the poverty aspect. The real question in terms of the economic aspects of it are how do we pay for travel on a consumer level? Most people use credit cards. Yes. Uh, and right now we're seeing huge, massive defaults on consumer credit card payments to banks, uh, which are, of course, banks are banks. They're going to limit their exposure. They're either going to lower credit lines or freeze those accounts. Uh, then you couple that with massive unemployment. When we sort of come out of this, uh, Nick, do you think there might be a new kind of a financial model of how people are even going to be able to afford to travel? Uh, as opposed to just using a credit card? Are we going back to the old days of the layaway plan 
where companies are going to have to self-finance to get people to be to the position where they can actually afford to go from A to B. It might be in, it, it might be in some form even desirable. So, so first of all, I think that the credit default at the consumer level, it, it's, it happens, but it is a relatively localized phenomenon to, to or, or let's put it differently, certain cultures have a larger propensity to, to use these credit elements than others, and that is largely rooted culturally. Um, but, but the substance of your question is, will less people be able to pay for travel, whether that's right. through a credit card or something else? In the short term, and the short term may well be three to five to six years, yes, absolutely, right? Um, what that really means, and, and is this is maybe an interesting link to sustainability, right? Where we have been wasteful as a global industry is not only in water, <laughs> and, uh, in, you know, electricity and in building lands. Our, our biggest resource, if you so will, that we have in the tourism industry is actually the tourist. And we have not used the tourists that we had to come to our destinations as good as we can. Right, so we've worked a, a huge volume game, and we've needed unbelievable masses of flow through of tourists in order to keep this system going. And with a growing tourism propensity, that worked very well. But it, 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 it it's something that even without a COVID may have come to an end through elements such as over tourism, etc. So, to your point, will less people be traveling at least in the mid short term? Yes, purely mathematically. What what can we do in order to uh, to soften the blow from a smaller demand, it, it, it is to increase spend penetrations for those tourists that we have. So when we finally get a tourist or when we get 80% of the tourists that we used to have or 50 or 20, we may wish to use the time that we have now as a reflection of saying, well, how can I get an extra five bucks from him or an extra 20 bucks? Or how do I perhaps create offers and experiences that may have him stay three days longer and do etc. And that's, I'm not saying this hasn't happened before, and I think destinations such as, you know, Visayas with Alain and many of them are, are great examples of how you can do this at, at the top level. But many of us in destinations that have done a volume game, volume game may wish to ask ourselves, how can we more sustainably commercialize the tourists that we have while still providing them an excellent experience? Exactly. And that's the big question that we're going to have to see going forward. Uh, we're just about out of time, but for Elena and Alain and Edmund, Obviously, we'll be watching carefully as you reopen. You are our uh, laboratory animal, so to speak, uh, as we try to figure out how we get through this and, and then how that money is applied in a reinvestment strategy to be sustainable, not just on an economic level, but to, but to maintain some sort of protocol in the health crisis. And uh, Peter and, and Nicholas, thank you so much for joining thank us. Uh, much appreciated to everybody. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to my distinguished colleague going right back to to Raja. Thank you, Peter. Thank you and goodbye to all of you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. Stay safe. Be well.